I am somewhat overwhelmed this week because as I look around this room, I see people from so many different avenues of my life, including a number of former students, colleagues, parishioners <laughs> um, who are gathered here, and whoever you are, and alums that I have seen through 12 years of being on this faculty too. So um, it is a privilege to be here and to be doing these lectures. In yesterday's lectures, I looked at some statistics that show us how during the past 60 years, the numbers of preaching women have increased dramatically in the United States. In some denominations, Lutheran, Episcopal, Assemblies of God, the numbers have tripled in the last 20 to 25 years. In others, United Methodists, Disciples of Christ, Church of the Brethren, the numbers have doubled, and in a few, like the United Church of Christ and the Unitarian Universalists, women and men have reached parity among ordained clergy. This is not the case across the board. The two largest church bodies in the U.S., the Roman Catholic Church and the Southern Baptist Convention, still do not ordain women at all. And in other bodies, the growth has been pretty stagnant. But it is nevertheless remarkable that in the last 60 years, between 1959 and 2019, many church-going Protestants in the U.S. have gone from seeing only males in their pulpits to hearing women preach on a regular basis. What I want to explore in the second and the third of these lectures is the question, so what difference has the presence of these women made? What do we know now about preaching that we didn't know before women were going into the field of preaching scholarship and taking up their pulpits? And what effect has the presence of all these women had on how we experience the sermon itself? Tomorrow I'm going to look at that last question. What effect has all these preaching women had on the experience? And today I want to focus on one major shift that has occurred in what we know about preaching because of the presence of so many women scholars now in the field. When I entered seminary in 1975, it was easy to believe that women had only started preaching a few decades before I got there. <clears throat> the only women preachers I ever heard about, frankly, were the sort of trailblazers in my own denominations, the early women who had been ordained. When great preachers were discussed in our classrooms, names like William Sloan Coffin, Harry Emerson Fosdick, Martin Luther King Jr., they were all male. Even in church history classes, there was very little mention of any women preachers who had preceded us. Christine Smith, a former, well, a retired professor of preaching from United Theological Seminaries in the Twin Cities, and one of the foremothers of the field of homiletics that I interviewed before doing these lectures, says that was the case for her as well when she was a graduate student at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley in the early 1980s. She went to do a PhD in preaching and worship. One of her required comprehensive exams was a comprehensive exam on great U.S. preachers. There were six men on that list, not a woman to be seen. <laughs> and she said that, frankly, it was while she was studying for that comprehensive exam that she made her decision that she was going to do her Ph.D. work on a feminist approach to preaching, <laughs> which she did. And her book, Weaving the Sermon, Preaching from a Feminist Perspective, was frankly the only feminist perspective of preaching we homiletical scholars had on our shelves for several decades. It was not until I was in my first preaching assignment, teaching assignment in the late 1980s, that I learned that a branch of the Presbyterian Church, the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, had actually ordained a woman minister back at the end of the 19th century by the name of Louisa Woosley. <laughs> Louisa Woosley grew up in Kentucky, wrestled mightily with her call, suppressing it for years until she finally ended up preaching on horseback from Kentucky all the way to the west coast of the United States. <laughs> so successful was she in her preaching ministry 
both in terms of winning souls for Christ and raising money, that her presbytery ordained her in 1898, 1889, sorry, touching off a controversy that went all the way to her church's General Assembly. Her autobiography, Shall Woman Preach, and subtitled, I love the subtitle, or the question answered. <laughs> What a gutsy woman, was first published in 1891. And it made a profound effect on me when I first came across it. It was absolutely revelatory to me that here had been a preaching woman who lived in a century, several before mine, who had actually been ordained and had preached her whole life. Her book addresses objections to women preaching based on problematic biblical texts and her own very thoughtful reinterpretations of those texts. <laughs> Indeed, it is interesting that it was for Woosley when she read the Bible from cover to cover, trying to convince herself she was not called to preach, that she came away saying she could see absolutely not one biblical reason she wasn't called to preach. <laughs> I am grateful to this day to another foremother of my academy, Mary Lynn Hudson of Memphis Theological Seminary, for writing her doctoral dissertation on Louisa Woosley and lifting her up for the education of us all. In the mid-1990s, it was a student in one of my early women's ways of preaching classes at Princeton Seminary who first introduced me to Jarena Lee. <laughs> Jarena Lee, an African-American woman who was born to free parents in Cape May, New Jersey, was licensed to preach in the early 19th century by Richard Allen, founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. During the Great Awakening, she preached widely in the Mid-Atlantic and New England states, a dangerous venture for any woman traveling alone, and especially for an African-American woman when she sometimes traveled below the Mason-Dixon line. She, too, published an autobiography, the first autobiography by an African-American woman in the United States, in which she recounts the story of her call and the diary of her many travels to preach the gospel. She recounts her call to preach in this way in her autobiography. Between four and five years after my sanctification, an impressive silence fell upon me, and I stood as if someone was about to speak to me, yet I had no such thought in my heart. But to my utter surprise, there seemed to sound a voice, which I thought I distinctly heard and most certainly understood, which said to me, go, preach the gospel. I immediately replied aloud, no one will believe me. Again, I listened, and again, the same voice seemed to say, preach the gospel. I will put words in your mouth. I will turn your enemies to become your friends. I am grateful to that former student for introducing me to Jarena Lee, but I'm also thankful that times have changed and we don't have to rely anymore on word of math mouth or happenstance to learn about the her stories of women preaching. Women scholars in my field have in recent day, decades written books or doctoral dissertations highlighting the contributions of women preachers of prior centuries. In 2004, Unju Mary Kim, a trailblazing Korean American clergywoman and professor of preaching at Iliff School of Theology, published the first comprehensive history of women preaching beginning with the women preachers at the tomb and going all the way through to the colonial and post-colonial Korean preachers of her acquaintance. When Anna Carter Florence, professor of preaching at Columbia Theological Seminary and a former Beecher lecturer, wrote her own feminist theology of women and preaching entitled Preaching as Testimony, she began by discussing three prominent women preachers in three different centuries of church history. Anne Marbury Hutchinson, who preached in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 17th century. Sarah Osborne, 
who preached in Newport, Rhode Island in the 18th century, and Jarena Lee in the 19th century, century. And she pointed to the importance of testimony in each of these women's witnesses. Another scholar in our field, Beverly Zink Sawyer, explored the intersection between preaching women and the women's suffrage movement in the 19th century in her book, From Preachers to Suffragists. Zink Sawyer focused her research on women like Antoinette Brown Blackwell, Olympia Brown, and Anna Howard Shaw, all of whom saw their calling to the suffrage movement as an extension of their call to ministry all of whom left a preaching ministry to take up the band of the suffrage movement. And when Martha Simmons and Frank Thomas published their anthology of African-American preaching from 1740 to the present, other African-American women preachers of the past rose to the fore. Julia Foote, Zilpha Elaw, Sojourner Truth, as well as more contemporary women preachers like the late Katie Geneva Cannon, Prathia Hall, Barbara Harris, Vashti Murphy McKenzie, and Renita Weems. About the same time that women homileticians were beginning to forefront women's histories in their work, colleagues in the field of church history were doing the same. And we have learned a lot about early preaching women from their scholarship. For instance, from Rebecca Larson, we have learned that there was a large number of Quaker women who crossed the Atlantic from the British Isles to preach in the colonies before our nation was a nation in the colonies in the early 1700s. In her book, Daughters of Light, Larson estimates that between 1300 and 1500 Quaker women preached in the British Isles and the American colonies in the first three quarters of the 18th century. They traveled the east coast of the United States between South Carolina and Maine, with many of them preaching on both sides of the ocean. They ranged in age from 17 to 69 and came from every station of life. Some were recognized by their communities in the British Isles to be what they called public friends, because of their giftedness in public speaking and vocal prayer, and were sent out by those communities with formal letters of introduction to Quaker meetings in Europe or North America. One of those Quaker women, Rachel Wilson, who lived between 1720 and 1775, preached in places as diverse as Faneuil Hall in Boston, the courthouse in New Haven, Connecticut, the College of New Jersey in Princeton, which later became Princeton University, the old Baptist Meeting House in Charlestown, now Charleston, South Carolina. She was likened in eloquence to the popular evangelist George Whitfield. And among those to whom she preached were then Governor of New Jersey, William Franklin, son of Benjamin Franklin, Virginia Assemblyman Patrick Henry, then Governor of Virginia, Norburn Berkeley, and the Reverend Ezra Stiles, a Congregationalist minister who later became president of Yale College. <laughs> in her 1998 book, Strangers and Pilgrims, Female Preaching in America, 1740 to 1845, Catherine Breckus, professor of the history of religion in America at Harvard Divinity School, lifts up the preaching of evangelical women during the first and second great awakenings in our nation. She estimates that more than 100 African American and white women preached in churches, at camp meetings, at outdoor revivals, and in gathering halls from the mid 18th to mid 19th centuries. These women tended to come from newly formed denominations, such as the African Methodists, the Christian Connection, Free Will Baptists, Millerites, who insisted that distinctions of race, class, and sex were less important than whether or not one had been saved. Among these women was Harriet Livermore, who preached to the Congress of the United States in January 1827, for an hour and a half. <laughs> She'd had her say. <laughs> a 
Abigail Roberts, a popular Christian connection preacher in New York and New Jersey in the early 19th century, whose crowds were so great that she had to hold her meetings outdoors in fields and forests. Eleanor Knight, a free will Baptist preacher who served as an itinerant throughout New England. And Phoebe Palmer, one of the founders of the holiness movement within Methodism and one of the most popular preachers of her time. Through, though these preaching women attracted large crowds and their influence on building up churches and inspiring their audiences was highly significant, Breckus writes they were virtually written out of their church histories in the mid-19th century. A silence, she said, that has been perpetuated ever since. In Daughters of Thunder, Betty Collier Thomas tells the story of late 19th and early 20th century African-American preaching women who became widely known in the U.S. for their preaching ministries. Women like Elizabeth, a former slave whose name is unknown to us. Amanda Barry Smith, Sojourner Truth. Some slaves, some free, were trailblazers who, according to Collier Thomas, overcame ridicule and rejection, penury, fears of re-enslavement and discrimination, unhappy marriages, among other obstacles. After experiences with conversion and sanctification in which the Holy Spirit commissioned them to preach, they each set out to answer the call. Nothing could deter them. Not laws and attitudes that opposed women's preaching, not even geographical limits. These women spread their message throughout the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic states, the South, the Midwest, and even across oceans. Even before women began preaching in the New World, we have solid evidence that women had been preaching on the continent of Europe. Quaker women had been preaching in England since their founding in the mid-17th century. Margaret Fell, an early leader in Quakerism who married George Fox, the, one of the founders of, of Quakerism, was herself a preacher as well as an outspoken proponent of women preaching. According to Duke historian Curtis Freeman, Puritan women were also preaching during this era on the European continent. Freeman notes that between 1640 and 1660, as many as 300 women prophetesses who were radical Puritans were preaching and publishing their thoughts in England. By the 1760s, Methodist women, such as Sarah Crosby and Mary Bosanquet Fletcher, had moved from exhorting to preaching with John Wesley's approval. And as the character of Baby Suggs Holy in Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved, reminds us, though their histories are largely lost to us, women were spiritual leaders in enslaved communities long before emancipation arrived and may well have been preaching in Africa long before they were forced into slavery. In surveying this history, questions naturally arise around the conditions that allowed and encouraged women to preach. Are there any patterns that can be observed about the openings women found for preaching and what occasioned them? In my own survey of these preaching women and their stories, I identify three significant types of transitions that allowed openings for women to preach. Ecclesial slash theological transitions, political and geographical transitions, and personal transitions in the lives of the women themselves. And I want to briefly reflect on what it was about each of these transitions that opened the way for women to preach. First, ecclesial and theological transitions. One of the things that stands out when reading the history of early women preachers is how often their opportunities to preach came in the midst of the emergence of a new sect or a new denomination. <laughs> when the spirit was on the loose, <laughs> as I like to think of it, on the loose, that is not tamped down by church hierarchies and polities, not hemmed in by church dogmas, but allowed to manifest itself in brand new ways women frequently found openings to preach the gospel. Quaker women, for instance, were encouraged to preach from their founding because of the theology embraced by George Fox. 
Among Quaker tenets was a strong belief that each person possessed within the spirit of God and could rely on the spirit of truth, the presence of the living Christ within, to lead them into all truth. Since the light is the same in male and female, which cometh from Christ, Fox said, by the power of the spirit, women have the same capacity as men to voice the word of God. Quakers did not rely on professional clergy to lead their meetings, nor did they observe sacraments such as baptism and the Lord's Supper. Instead, they sat in silence, waiting for the Spirit to speak within members of the gathered community. Since Quakers believed that inspired words came from the same source, the indwelling Spirit of God, it was irrelevant who actually preached at the meeting. Rebecca Larson notes that their contemporaries were often quite shocked by the gender equality evidence when Quakers gathered for worship. Young girls could be quite vocal at such meeting while leading men remained silent. <laughs> In Strangers and Pilgrims, Catherine Breckus makes the case that many of the evangelical women who preached in the U.S. in the 18th and 19th centuries came not from the more well-established denominations, the mainline churches, for instance, but from emerging sects and denominations who believed that the end of the world was near, that women were needed to herald Christ's imminent return, calling people to repentance and salvation. She writes, these sects invested female preaching with transcendent significance. Indeed, they did not allow women to preach in spite of their femininity, but because of their femininity. A female preacher was a religious outsider in a way that a male preacher could not be. She was a stranger and a pilgrim who had sacrificed everything, pride, money, family, security, for the glory of God. She was a mother and a sister who could nurture the family of God. Most of all, a female preacher was a living embodiment of Joel's promise that women as well as men would prophesy at the end times. Many of these emerging denominations that were taking root were taking root among people from very humble origins and in a climate that valued heartfelt religious experience and direct divine inspiration far more than theological education. <laughs> Consequently, they created a religious culture in which even the most humble convert, the poor, the unlearned, the slave, the female, felt qualified to preach the gospel. Early evangelical preaching women claimed their right to interpret the scriptures as they saw fit and defended their right by reference to Old Testament leaders such as Deborah, Miriam, Huldah, and Esther, as well as to New Testament Pauline co-workers such as Phoebe and Priscilla and the four daughters of Philip. They also deemed to be highly significant, as the Quaker women had, that the prophet Joel had promised that the Spirit would be poured out upon them as well. More than the Quaker women before them, it was important to these evangelical women to make a biblical defense of their call, which they frequently did in their writings and in their sermons and their bibliographies. In Daughters of Thunder, Betty Collier Thomas notes that many of the African-American women preachers of the late 19th and early 20th century were influenced by and drawn toward the Wesleyan holiness tradition in their preaching. For example, Julia Foote, the first woman to be ordained a deacon in 1895 and the second woman to be ordained an elder in the AME Zion Church, was heavily influenced by the holiness movement in Methodism and its perfectionist doctrines of sanctification. For more than 50 years, she served as an itinerant evangelist, traveling and lecturing widely at camp meetings, revivals, and churches in California, the Midwest, the Northeast, and Canada. But Foote was not the only African-American woman influenced by the holiness movement. Collier Thomas notes that with only one exception, all of the 19th and 20th century preaching women she identified as in her book were associated at some point with Methodism and with its holiness tradition. What were the essential tenets of holiness belief? 
Collier Thomas identifies six. Its doctrine centered around human experience of God, had roots in scripture, emphasized the work of the Holy Spirit, created an aura of freedom that encouraged experimentalism, had a reformist and even revolutionary nature, and encouraged the formation of new denominations or new sects. Many of these tenets were especially conducive for encouraging women to preach. For example, an emphasis on a direct experience of the Holy Spirit led preaching women to assume, to assert that they had been called by a power higher than the church, namely by the power of God made manifest to them through the Holy Spirit's direct intervention. And thus they had to answer that call to preach. Many of these women also claimed they had been sanctified instantly as opposed to a gradual sanctification process. <laughs> and they claimed that this made them free of sin and holy enough to start preaching. <laughs> the revolutionary nature of the holiness movement helped these women find the courage to leave their families and to go on preaching mentions for months at a time, often encountering dangers and hardships all along the way. It also empowered many of them to deny denominational law and polity that would restrict their freedom to preach and to boldly take their place in pulpits at camp meetings, in forest, wherever they wanted to preach the gospel. As Collier Thomas summarizes it, empowered by their beliefs in holiness and sanctification, they overlooked their own hesitations about the matter. They profess they did not believe in having women preach. <laughs> they agonized over how to preserve their marital relations and attend to their duties as wives and mothers. But then they all decided they had to dedicate their lives to preaching the gospel. One of the troubling patterns that can be observed in the history of preaching women is that the more these new denominations, new sects, became institutionalized, the more the preaching of women was silenced and the more their preaching her story eliminated from church records. While the spirit was often on the loose in the early days of those movements, especially upon poorer and less educated populations of women, over time, patriarchy and hierarchy in church governments silence their preaching and force them to stay in their place. It is also important to note that few of these denominations approve the kinds of structural changes that would allow women to be ordained and to perform churchly duties like baptism and the Lord's Supper. Consequently, itineracy was often the only mode of preaching open to them, with only a handful of these early women actually serving local churches. A second type of transition that seems to have opened the way for women to preach can be seen in political transitions and the new geographies for preaching they occasion. For instance, the establishing of European colonies in the New World opened up a whole new field for women to consider for preaching. <laughs> this reality, as I've said, was certainly evidenced in the history of the Quaker preaching women of the 1700s, experiencing both a push from the British Isles, where Quakers were legally penalized for being dissenters from the Church of England, and the pull to a new world where Quakers not only dominated the colonial governments of Pennsylvania and Rhode Island, but also served New Jersey and North Carolina governments in significant numbers, Quaker women, often with the blessing and endorsement of their meeting houses in the British Isle, preached throughout the colonies. As Rebecca Larson notes, Quakerism, with its unpaid traveling ministry, requiring no church building, a minimum of organizational apparatus, and offering a faith shorn of liturgy, sacraments, and an intricate theology was uniquely suited to colonial American circumstances. These traveling Quaker women were known for their plain dress, their radical faith, their eloquent speaking. They attracted large audiences and made strong positive impressions, not only on women, but on leading men who came to hear them as well. 
Another example of how the geopolitical realities open up a way can be seen in the own expansion of the American westward frontier in the 19th century. Here, as in the case of the Quaker preaching women, political and ecclesial realities were often intertwined in opening the way for women to preach. For example, because there were not enough seminary educated men willing to go and preach in the new western territories, some denominational bodies began waiving the high educational standards for preachers which opened the way for women's proclamation. The Cumberland Church that I've already mentioned with Willowiza Woosley was one such denomination which advocated less stringent clergy education, greater sympathy for some of the great awakening revival techniques, and greater doctrinal freedom of expression. I've already mentioned that Louisa Woosley traveled by horseback for many years to preach in the late 19th and early centuries. By age 50, she reported that she had preached 6,343 sermons, witnessed 7,664 professions of faith, and baptized 358 people in 13 states. <laughs> Of course, not all geopolitical realities were conducive to women preaching. Catherine Breckus notes the tremendous risk African-American evangelical preachers of the 19th century took when they dared to go below the Mason-Dixon line to preach. She also notes that most of the evangelical preaching women before the Civil War came from the northern states, not from the more conservative southern states where societal pressures were stronger on women to stay in their place. Third transition, personal transitions in the lives of these early preaching women. What empowered these women to preach? What gave them courage to do so in the risk of tremendous ridicule, oppression, opposition, was their deep-seated belief that they had been called by God to do so whether it was through a dream, a vision, or a personal encounter with God while fully awake, whether the calling came through the study of scriptures or through prayer or at a religious meeting, evangelical preaching women consistently testify in both their sermons and their autobiographies that it was God who had called them and they had had nothing whatsoever to do with it. In me, indeed, many of them describe themselves as being poor, uneducated, lacking in eloquence, and marvel that God should choose such a vessel as them. Yet despite that strong sense of call, many of these women delayed answering that calling for months or even years because of the opposition they faced. Writes Breckus, Nancy Toll, a 19th century non-denominational preacher, debated for two solid years before finally becoming an itinerant. Jarena Lee waited eight years to take up her calling. And because she was illiterate and a slave, Elizabeth procrastinated for 29 years. What is even more striking to me, however, is that in nearly all the recorded cases, evangelical women only began preaching after significant illness or tragedy struck their lives. Louisa Woosley recounts going through several serious battles with physical illness, including one in which she says, I was reduced to a frame as helpless as an infant before finally acquiescing and agreeing to preach. Ellen Stewart, a Methodist from Ohio, tried to quench the spirit by getting married rather than going to preach, and as a result, she sank into a deep depression. <laughs> It was not until two years later that she finally began preaching. Eleanor Knight, a Christian connection preacher, had suffered abuse from her husband and had lost two children to death, children she believed God had taken away from her as a result of her spiritual disobedience before she actually began preaching. Jarena Lee lost her husband and several children to death and was a widow supporting two infant children alone when she finally took up the preaching mantle. 
and Zilpha Elaw, an early 19th century African Methodist preacher, almost died from an internal inflammation before commencing her preaching ministry. One cannot help but wonder, when reading the stories of these women, how much the societal pressures upon them to conform to the feminine norms of the day and the ecclesial roadblocks raised to their preaching as women contributed to their illnesses of mind and body and to their despair. Pressured to marry and have children, ridiculed and admonished for, quote, exposing themselves when they dared speak in public, and encouraged to live into a feminine ideal of subservience, piety, and humility, these women faced obstacles at every turn. What is remarkable is that they nevertheless persevered, believing in their heart of hearts that they would be forsaking God's calling upon their lives if they did not seize the openings available to them, trusting the Spirit to empower them and giving and to give them the words to preach. So what might we in the church learn from the history of these early women preachers? For starters, we are reminded that God's spirit not only rests upon those whom our church bodies deem to ordain through official channels, but also upon countless others who may not seem to us educated enough, doctrinaire enough, or the right gender, race, class, or sexual orientation to meet our fallen human standards. It was through the ministry of spirit-anointed lay people, women and men, that the Church of Christ was first given birth. And as this history reminds us, it is often through the preaching of spirit-anointed lay people of all varieties that the Church continues to be reborn and renewed. In her soon-to-be-published book, my former colleague here at Yale Divinity School, Danielle McRae, the book is called The Censored Pulpit, she makes a convincing case that the medieval visionary Julian of Norwich was not only a mystic, as we often refer to her, but a mystical preacher who through her life lived in prophetic vocation as an anchoress and through her visionary writings preached from her anchor hold in Norwich, England. In the final chapter of her book, McCrae urges us to expand our usual definitions of preaching to recognize that there are many people today, including many lay people who, like Julian, are not preaching from pulpits in church sanctuaries or even in modes or forms we normally identify as preaching, but who nevertheless are preaching through their words and through their witness. One of the examples she suggests is that of British retreat leader and author of retreat meditations, Evelyn Underhill, who was herself heavily influenced by Julian of Norwich's writings. Another is Mother Willie Mae Ford Smith, a 20th century gospel singer who must have originated the sneak a preach mode of preaching I talked about yesterday. <laughs> because Smith would sing a gospel song and included in it always, somewhere along the way, was a brief sermonette. Smith did not see herself as a singer alone, writes McRae. She considered herself a preacher, an evangelist. Her experience illumines an often overlooked form of preaching undertaken by African American women. From our survey of women preachers in the US, both today and yesterday, I think we could add to McRae's list of those who preach outside the box, often as outsiders. Our list might include those Catholic women who have been preaching to one another in convents for centuries, <laughs> or who preach in local congregations today, though not necessarily at the Eucharist. We could include those women who preach on the internet, or at coffee houses, or in other non-church locales, because their denominations won't ordain them. Our list might include women who have preached through their own devotional writings, or who during the Bible studies they lead often blur that line between teaching and preaching. 
perhaps rather than bemoaning the increasing number of ed uneducated lay people who are serving pulpits in geographical areas underserved by ordained clergy, we seminary trained clergy should be celebrating and encouraging and offering ongoing training for them. Perhaps rather than jealously guarding our own local parish pulpits, we should be opening them on occasion to lay people, both within and without our congregation, who have received a word from God they want to bring to us. I'm going to talk tomorrow about Maggie Rabbi Winnig's practice in her congregation um, in New York City of inviting lay people in the congregation, often people who disagreed with her and what she said in the pulpit, to preach on Yom Kippur afternoon. <laughs> It's a practice we Christian preachers might attend to, think about a bit. <laughs> and perhaps, rather than viewing preaching as a clerical calling, we who believe the Spirit has indeed been poured out on all flesh should reclaim it as a calling of the whole people of God. Second, this history reminds us of the deep harm that is done to those in our midst who are called by God to preach but who on the basis of gender or race or sexual orientation or class or differing abilities are denied that right. The history of these early preaching women gives testimony that such denials have in the past led to serious illness of the mind, body, and spirit. Women have suffered and suffered mightily by the refusal of the church to let them do what they believe God has called them to do. And according to Bishop Minerva Carcano, another of the four mothers I interviewed, clergy women are still suffering illness in disproportionate numbers today. Says Carcano, at every place that has, I've been as a pastor, then as a district superintendent, and now as a bishop, a thread that runs throughout the experience of ministry for myself with colleague women has been illness. Illness of differing degrees, some of it very serious illness, like cancer. And we have gathered to talk about that as pastors, as superintendents, as bishops, because we have felt that. We have felt that the burden of continuing to have to challenge systems that are still committed to keeping the voice of women out, or quieted even, is very damaging to the spirit and the body of women. And we need to be attentive to that and help one another. Perhaps it is time for mainline denominations who have in recent years celebrated anniversaries of the ordination of women also publicly to repent of their past histories of discrimination against women and suppression of their voices in the pulpit. And perhaps it is time for denominations who still deny ordination to women and marginalized others to do some serious soul searching about the harm they are causing not only to women, but to the church as a whole in the process. For let us not forget, when we fail to ordain half of the human race and acknowledge their callings as preachers of the gospel, it is not only women or LGBTQ communities who suffer. The whole Church of Christ loses voices critical to its understanding of the whole gospel of God. Amen. Sister Joan Delaplane of the Dominican Order of Preachers, the first woman member and president of the Academy of Homiletics, told a story during my interview with her that continues to haunt me and that speaks eloquently both to the harm done to the women themselves who are called to preach and have that call denied and the harm done to the church when women are not allowed access to the pulpit. Sister Joan recounts a time in her life when she, a Dominican sister, had just finished a 40-day retreat and had spent an entire day meditating on the biblical text from the lectionary for the upcoming Sunday in the church year. It was profound. It was wonderful, she says. I was so excited because there was no priest at this retreat center where we were gathered, so we were gonna go down to a neighboring church. They had a 5 p.m. Saturday night liturgy, so we were going to that mass. She recounts how the preacher at this church gave the announcements and then, I'm quoting her, literally just read the scriptures at us. Then he said, you know, it's too hot. 
we're going to skip the preaching today. Sister Joan comments, now it was about 80 degrees. It was lovely. <laughs> but the preacher continued, let me tell you this joke I heard. Then after telling a joke that wasn't at all humorous, he said, oh, and let me tell you about the nuns down the road. They had a swinging party for this jubilarian. I'm telling you, you should have seen that table. Today they've got six gals entering that community and I want you to know they're good looking gals. Sister Joan recounts, I was shaking. I was literally shaking in the pew. I was so upset and so angry. This is the only time the people of God can get nourished by the word of God. The word for the day was so profound and beautiful, and this is what they have to sit through? Now this is my one and only time with this priest. I'm leaving, I'm getting out of there. But my pain, when you talk about pain, it's a pain of the people who are experiencing this kind of famine from not being fed by the word. I sat there teaching, preaching, gifted to be able to preach, having, sp having spent the whole day on that word. I would have loved to have been able to share it, but the one test I failed in seminary was anatomy. That's sad. The kinds of stories women and their calls that historians and homileticians have been reclaiming are not just stories of the past, they're stories of the present as well. If you ask me, the church has a lot of repenting to do, not just for what it has done to women, but for what it has done and continues to do to the whole body of Christ by denying women witness in the pulpits. Finally, this history calls us to become as wise as serpents in our reading of the times and our identifications of those moments of transition in our own day that might be openings for people on the margins to preach. I think, for example, of that Roman Catholic seminary and I taught who had a burning in her bones to preach but loved her church too much to leave it. She seemed upon the internet as a place where she could do so freely and publicly, developing a blog site where she could preach and enter into dialogue with people all over the world about her sermons. Another former student at YDS who grew up Pentecostal but most recently pastored a small UCC church in upstate New York had a passion for reaching unchurched millennials with her preaching. They were not present in great numbers in her small rural congregation on Sunday mornings, so she began videotaping her sermons each week and then posting it on Facebook. As a follow-up, she has engaged in dialogue with millennial followers, often in coffee houses, about the concerns she's raised in her pulpit. I also think of a third former YDS student now a chaplain at a large female undergraduate institution in Georgia who has established a blog site to promote African-American women in their preaching. She has recently published a book of her own wonderful sermons. And this evening, the alums of this divinity school will award her with the William Sloan Coffin Award for Peace and Justice. Nichelle Gidry, are you here? I, stand up. <laughs> All of these women are exemplars of what homiletician Martha Simmons thinks, frankly, is a wave of the future for clergy women, especially women from churches whose denominations won't ordain them. Of all the homiletical foremothers I interviewed for this project, Simmons was the most pessimistic about ever seeing significant change in the black Baptist denomination in which she was raised. She frankly told me she thought I could come back and ask her the same questions in another 20 years and nothing much would have changed. Simmons herself has charted her own path of writing and preaching, largely outside of official church channels, and while she admits it's had its ups and downs, especially financially, she has found freedom to work on her own terms fulfilling. 
She is strongly encouraging younger clergy women she mentors to see the internet as a space where they can freely preach, build up congregations, and live out their God-given callings. These women, it seems to me, are following in the footsteps of their female ancestors of earlier centuries, taking those openings that are available to them in this time of technological transition and using those openings to foster women's preaching. A final personal postscript. In a book he wrote about one branch of my family's history, my now deceased and I should say greatly beloved maternal grandfather, Dr. James English Kouser Jr., recounts that two Quaker preachers from Ireland, Mary Pisley and Catherine Payton, visited a colony of Quakers living in the area known as Camden, South Carolina, in December of 1753 and preached there for 12 days. Among the settlers there were a family of Englishes, my ancestors, who had emigrated to the New World from Ireland only five months prior. My grandfather, a very conservative Presbyterian minister who opposed women's ordination, including my own, until the day of his death, <laughs> comments on the courage of these women and the hardships they must have endured as they traveled 125 miles from Charleston, South Carolina to Camden, covering ter territory that had no road going through it until that year. Talk about literal trailblazing. <laughs> he also surmises that several of the youth in our family, the English family, were probably among those converted by these women and their preaching. Yet, when it comes to giving reasons for the decline of Quakerism in South Carolina in that same century, my very Presbyterian grandfather concludes, such itineration as was undertaken by Mary Pisley and Catherine Payton, besides laboring under the prohibition expressly laid down for them in scripture, 1 Timothy 2, 12 to 14, <laughs> was not suited to the pioneer life of South Carolina at that period. I can't help but wonder, though, would I be doing what I'm doing today if it hadn't been for the courageous witness of those early Quaker preaching women? I can't help but wonder how many of us gathered here today come from families where, preach, preach, Quaker, where preaching women at some point along the way in our family histories brought the gospel to bear in such persuasive, inspired, and spirit-filled ways that lives were changed, faith was kindled, and new life paths were charted. I thank God for these early U.S. preaching women and I also thank God for the revolution in scholarship about women in preaching that has begun only during the last several decades and that allows their her stories to come forward so that all of us can get to know them better and have our own courage and resolve strengthened through their witness. Thank you.